Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael Collins, and I'm the, um, the Director General of the IIEA. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this um, Institute webinar as part of the Global Europe Project, which is supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs. This project aims to address, analyze, and communicate to a wider audience the debate on the EU's role in the world and Ireland's role in the multilateral order, with a particular focus, of course, on Ireland's term as an elected member of the UN Security Council, uh, which began on the 1st of January 2021 and comes to an end in December 2022. Um, we're delighted uh, to be joined uh, this afternoon by the Minister for Foreign Affairs and indeed the Minister for Defence, Simon Coveney, uh, who has uh, taken time out of his busy schedule to share with us um, the work that Ireland has been doing in the Security Council and the Security Council activity generally uh, in the course of the last 12 months. Minister Coveney will speak to us for 20 minutes or so. And then we'll go to Q&A with you, our audience, in the usual way. I think everybody is very familiar with this at this stage, and you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, which, of course, you'll see on your screen. And please feel free to send uh, your questions in throughout the session. No need to wait until the minister has finished his remarks. If you've got questions to ask uh, and in preparation, uh, uh, please let them, um, uh, please, please send them in as they occur to you. And we will come to them once Minister Coveney has finished his presentation. A reminder that today's presentation and the Q&A are both on the record, and please uh, feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA, and we're also live streaming this afternoon's discussion, so a very warm welcome to all of you joining via YouTube. Minister Coveney, uh, my, my notes say here to introduce the minister, but the minister really does need no further introduction. So with that, I'm going to hand straight over to you uh, for your remarks, and I look forward to those and the Q&A session that will follow. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. And uh, in January, I spoke at the IAEA event shortly after we took up our seat uh, as an elected member of the Security Council. I set out the principles and priorities for our term. Uh, and so it's a pleasure to return today, albeit virtually, uh, to update you on our work on the Council since then, uh, and to look to our plans uh, for the year ahead. The timing of your event is fitting. Uh, yesterday was the 66th anniversary of Ireland joining the United Nations in 1955. The UN has been very much at the heart of Irish foreign policy since then. We've been an active and committed member not least through the remarkable service of members of our defense forces in peacekeeping operations for more than 60 years uninterrupted. This commitment to the UN is a matter of both values and of interests. As a small country, Ireland depends on international law and a values-based strong multilateral system to uphold our own sovereignty. We ran for election to the Security Council because the Council, despite its shortcomings, and it does have shortcomings, continues to perform a crucial function at the centre of that multilateral system. Since taking up our seat, we've played, I hope, a constructive role, bringing pragmatism and principle to the Council table. This, is, this hasn't been easy, and it's not without its frustra frustrations in terms of getting things done. There have been times when we would have liked the Council to do a lot more and to speak out more bluntly and more clearly. Progress on the Council is slow and it's incremental at times. Uh, sometimes it is much too slow and much too incremental. But we have seen success also through patient and painstaking diplomacy at times. We have delivered results that are making a crucial difference to ordinary civilians often very vulnerable people caught up in conflict. That is the fundamental reason why we competed for the Security Council in the first place. Nowhere has this been more true than relating to Syria. Earlier this year, Ireland and Norway successfully led negotiations on the renewal of the critical Syrian humanitarian cross-border resolution. It ensured that life-saving humanitarian aid was able continue to reach 3.4 million Syrian men, women, and children in the northwest of the country. The 12-month renewal in July was supported by all council members, 
And I think it is worth noting that this was the first time in five years that the Council unanimously renewed the resolution. We'll continue to prioritise this in the months ahead, working to ensure that humanitarian aid can reach all those in need across Syria. We're more than aware that humanitarian aid alone will not solve the deep divisions or address accountability and the need for political transition in Syria. But it is essential to limit suffering among the Syrian people. And we'll also keep pressure on for a just and sustainable solution to the horrors perpetrated on people there. When we were elected to the council last year, we certainly didn't expect Ethiopia to be at the center of our work. But the, but the deteriorating conflict and the immense human suffering uh, that, it, that it has wrought has compelled Ireland to act. And we certainly have been clear and vocal and at times in the spotlight on this issue. We've worked hard since the start of the year to ensure that the Security Council's attention has remained on Ethiopia and on the catastrophic humanitarian and human rights situation there. There are currently more than 6 million people um, uh, in, uh, under threat of, of famine right now. We have convened public and private meetings on the issue, lobbied for engagement by the UN Secretary General and the African Union, and secured the Council's agreement on two separate statements. I've personally spoken to the Secretary General on a number of occasions on the issue, as well as to President Kenyatta uh, in, uh, in Kenya, uh, Secretary of State Blinken, and other regional and international leaders. Working in close cooperation with African partners and others, we have ensured that the Council has united in calling for a cessation of hostilities and, of course, full humanitarian access for those who need it also. However, the conflict in Ethiopia continues, and our work on the Council will also continue. Ireland's partnership with, with Ethiopia is long-standing. In 1936, it was Ireland, as chair of the League of Nations, which defended the independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of what was then Abyssinia, in the face of an invasion by, by Mussolini's forces. We have worked in friendship and partnership with the people of Ethiopia for many years, supporting their social and economic development. We opened an embassy in Addis Ababa in 1994. Ethiopia has been our largest bilateral development partner in recent years. So I very much regret the decision recently by the Ethiopian government to reduce the number of diplomats in our embassy by two thirds. We had six diplomats there. They effectively have asked four of those to leave. However, Ireland's commitment to and friendship with the people of Ethiopia remains steadfast. It is rooted in the principles which informed us 85 years ago and which continue to inform us today. Our relationship with Ethiopia is one of a network of deep and long-standing partnerships with countries in Africa that have informed our work on the Council. We've prioritized engagement with African partners on the Council and consistently supported strengthened cooperation with the African Union. The AU and regional organizations in Africa have an instrumental role in responding to crises and of course, building lasting peace. We've worked in close partnership with Niger, uh, to support the UN Office for West Africa and the Sahel's work on conflict prevention, democracy and human rights, and on issues of hunger and conflict and climate and security. Much of our work with African partners has had women, peace and security at its core. We know from our own experience on this island that peace must be inclusive if it is to be sustainable. And women must have a place at the table and participate fully and equally in decision-making. During our presidency of the Security Council in September, we brought 16 women civil society briefers to the council table. That was a record, by the way, in terms of women's participation. This reflected our belief that if the Security Council is not hearing directly from those most affected by conflict and those most likely to drive lasting change, it's not doing its job properly. As co-chairs with Mexico of the Council's 
informal expert group on women, peace and security, we have turned principles into practice. Every day, quietly, without fanfare, but on file after file, we integrate women, peace and security as an agenda into the council's work. We established the first WPS presidency trio with Kenya and Mexico, acting together in a cross-regional alliance to help close the gap between rhetoric and reality. This made uh, WPS a concrete and tangible priority during three consecutive Security Council presidencies in September, October, and again in November. Our commitment to the Women, Peace and Security agenda was central to our response to events in Afghanistan. As the crisis there escalated so quickly and so tragically in the summer, Ireland ensured that the crucial issue of the fundamental rights of women and girls was central to the Council's actions. We convened meetings on the crisis facing Afghan women, speaking out to focus the world's attention on the specific risks facing them. We ensured that the situation facing them was addressed in the Insecurity Council resolution, uh, renewing the mandate of the UN mission in Afghanistan. I chaired a debate on Afghanistan during the uh, during Ireland's presidency of the Security Council in September and invited civil society briefers, uh, Wasma Frog and uh, Malala Yousafzai uh, to participate. And they gave powerful testimony of the devastating impacts of the current crisis on the Afghan people. When Ireland held the presidency of the Security Council in September, our primary responsibility was to manage the agenda for that month, as you would expect. We steered the council through complex discussions on a range of important and urgent issues, including Afghanistan, Libya, Sudan, South Sudan, Syria, Yemen, and of course, the Middle East peace process. Presidency also presented an important opportunity to advance our own priorities. We convened three high-level signature meetings over the course of that month. The first of these took place on the 8th of September, when Ireland chaired an open debate of the Security Council on peacekeeping operations. Within three years of Ireland joining the UN in 1955, our peacekeepers had commenced uh, what is today the longest continuous UN service of any member state when it comes to peacekeeping. Our support for peacekeeping extends beyond deployments. Strengthening UN peacekeeping operations has been at the heart of our efforts on the Security Council. And it was an honour for me to chair the Council meeting on the 9th of September, when the UN Security Council Resolution 2594 on peacekeeping transitions was unanimously adopted. Led by Ireland, this resolution recognises that peace is not a moment in time, but a process. It highlights that the transition from peacekeeping operations to peace building programmes must be responsive to conditions on the ground and inclusive of the views of local communities. Resolution 2594 was just the second Security Council resolution on which Ireland has led the negotiations in our history on the Council. More importantly, it provides a framework uh, and a set of principles that will endure long beyond our Council term. It will guide UN missions, current and in the future, for the years to come, as they make the challenging but essential transition from peacekeeping to peace building. Our second signature presidency event took place on the 23rd of September, when the Taoiseach chaired a high level meeting on climate and security. This meeting brought together heads of state and governments uh, from across the council, uh, as well as the UN uh, Secretary General to discuss the linkages between climate change and security and conflict. At that meeting, the Taoiseach announced Ireland's intention along with Niger to convene discussions with all council members on a thematic resolution on climate and security. Our teams in New York and Dublin have worked tirelessly in the last two months since that meeting to craft a resolution that could garner maximum support from council members and from the wider UN membership. As some of you will know, 113 UN member states ultimately 
formally co-sponsored co that draft resolution. On Monday, 12 council members voted in favor of the resolution. India voted against and China abstained. Russia decided to use its veto to prevent the resolution being adopted. Let me be clear, the veto is an anachronism. No member state, no matter how powerful, how large, should be able to override the will of the vast majority of council members and the large majority of EU members. And so Ireland regrets the use of the veto in all circumstances of the council. We deeply regret the decision of Russia to use its veto to block the adoption of this important resolution. We believed over the last year that the weight of evidence and clarity of argument would bring the council to consensus. However, despite months of consultation, resulting in a draft resolution that was relatively modest in its scope, but clear in its ambition to put climate and security firmly on the council's agenda, was sadly not the case. Despite uh, this result earlier this week, uh, climate and security will inevitably continue in Security Council discussions. The adverse effects of climate change are only going to get worse, contributing to insecurity and exacerbating conflict. Anybody who suggests that climate change is not an accelerator of tension and conflict, in my view, is not realistic in terms of their understanding of the impacts of climate change. As our ambassador in New York put it, we remain undaunted. Ireland will continue to press for a robust approach on climate and security for the remainder of our time on the Security Council. Nuclear disarmament is another long-standing priority for Ireland. Since the early days of our membership of the UN, we have been constantly vocal on this file. Our third signature event during our Council Presidency marked the 25th anniversary of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. We have also taken on one of the most difficult roles on the Council as facilitator for the Iran nuclear non-proliferation deal, the JCPOA as it's called. This is an agreement that is of the utmost importance to regional and international peace and security. I visited Tehran in March this year uh, the first Irish foreign minister, by the way, to do so in over 20 years. And I hosted the former Iranian foreign minister in Dublin last May. I believe it is incumbent on Ireland to do everything possible to persuade all parties to return to full compliance with the JCPOA. But make no mistake, this is an enormously difficult task. And while I'm encouraged that the talks in Vienna started again in late November, uh, we need to see real progress on this and we need to see it fast. It's been a very busy year, more generally. Uh, I've addressed the Security Council virtually in person on 16 different occasions. President Higgins, the Taoiseach, Minister Ryan, Minister of State Brophy and Minister of State uh, Byrne have all participated in different council meetings at different times. Our teams in New York, Dublin, and across our mission network have worked tirelessly, and other government departments have supported us throughout. We've benefited in particular from the insight uh, and the day-to-day -day experience uh, of the Defence Forces, as we have worked to shape the mandates given to UN peacekeeping operations by the Council. Uh, and if ever there was a reminder of the connection between the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Department of Defence, I think our time in the Security Council has confirmed that, and that work will continue. As we enter the second half of our tenure on the Council, we will be guided by the principles that the government agreed at the start of our term, building peace, strengthening conflict prevention, and ensuring accountability. The promotion and protection of international human rights law and international human, uh, and international human rights law has been integral to our approach across the Security Council agenda. And this will remain, of course, the case for the next 12 months. We'll continue to play an active role on issues across the Council's agenda. Amongst these issues, the Middle East peace process is foremost in my mind. As you are aware, there are divergent views on this issue among Security Council members. And it's vital that we continue to use our seat on the Council productively 
engaging with like-minded partners, as well as those holding different views, so that we can try to build consensus on a way forward. Speaking to the Council in May, I made it clear that the Council had a collective responsibility to speak out in response to the escalation of violence. We will continue to insist on the need for a negotiated two-state solution, adherence to international law, and a respect for people's human rights. These may seem uh, uh, like a dim prospect for now, uh, but they are simply, but we have simply no other option uh, but to continue to advocate in this space. We cannot allow expediency or international fatigue to replace the fundamental need to end the occupation that began in 1967, to meet Israeli and Palestinian security needs, and to deliver the aspirations of the Palestinian people for statehood and sovereignty, while of course respecting the right of Israel to defend itself and protect its own state. The deteriorating situation in Myanmar is also deeply concerning. It is almost a year since the coup began. We will continue to use our seat on the Council to call for unhindered humanitarian access and full respect of human rights and international humanitarian law. Ireland has a history of engagement on peace in Colombia. We have focused uh, on work on the Council uh, to promote a lasting and just peace, as you would expect, ensuring that victims and vulnerable groups continue to be placed at the centre of the peace process there. And, of course, to support the work of the UN verification mission also. These efforts will continue throughout the rest of our term. Libya is due to hold elections on the 24th of December, despite the fact that many predicted they wouldn't happen. And it's a pivotal moment in the Libyan peace process. The UN is playing a central role in supporting the political process and ceasefire implementation. And we will continue uh, to support on the council, the Libyan people, in their challenging path towards achieving a sustainable and lasting peace. And on Afghanistan, we are working with partners on the Council and elsewhere to avert a humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, we are closely involved in ongoing Council negotiations with a view to securing humanitarian exemptions to the Taliban sanctions regime, which should help to ensure the direct provision of aid to the Afghan people via UN agencies and NGOs. But let's be in no doubt as to the task here, uh, as credible reports are now predicting that up to 23 million people could face uh, challenging famine-like conditions in the winter months ahead. We are matching our words with action. Uh, we have substantially increased our own humanitarian aid to UN agencies and NGOs working in Afghanistan. More than 500 vulnerable and at-risk Afghans have been offered refuge and resettlement status in Ireland, and almost 400 have already arrived. They include journalists, human rights defenders, particularly women, judges, members of minority ethnic communities, and members of the LGBTI community. The composition uh, of the council uh, will change next year. Uh, and we have been meeting and speaking with the five incoming uh, elected members, Albania, Brazil, Gabon, Ghana, and the United Arab Emirates. As with other elected and permanent members, we will engage openly and constructively with all of them. The Council has a responsibility to fulfil its mandate and to reach agreement on even the most difficult of issues on its agenda. That's not easy. And it sometimes requires painful compromise, but it is worth it. In the words of Dag uh, Hammerskold, uh, who as uh, Secretary General admitted Ireland to the UN uh, and first called on our peacekeepers to serve, he said the UN uh, was not created in order to bring us to heaven, but to save us from hell. Uh, and I'm proud of what we have achieved in our first year on the Security Council. Uh, and I'm determined uh, that we will build on our achievements uh, and do, I hope, even more next year. So I look forward to hearing your views and comments and to answer your questions. I know we have a very well-informed audience here. 
Um, so uh, hopefully uh, I can give you straight answers to straight questions uh, and obviously respond to your comments as well. Uh, thank you for taking the time to listen and I look forward uh, to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for that um, uh, hugely comprehensive um, overview of the work of the uh, of Ireland's Work and Security Council in the course of the last year, and also, as you say, looking forward into 2022. I'm going to go straight to questions, if I may. Um, there's so many of them that, that I think we just need to get going at it. Um, so, uh, not surprisingly, a number of questions here on the, the, Russia, the, Russia, the Russia, Russian veto. Uh, so, two questions on that, maybe to start with, Minister, if I may. Uh, one is from Paul Hosford from the Irish Examiner. And it is, is the Minister concerned that the intransigence uh, from China and Russia puts Ireland's priority of linking climate change to global security at the UN Security Council at risk of failure? And the second question from Bernd Steinmann from the Development Policy Coordinator of Helvetas. He asks, uh, in view of uh, Russia's recent veto against making climate change and security a standing issue uh, of the UN Security Council, how optimistic are you that this topic can nonetheless gain momentum um, at the UN Security Council? And what options are there to keep pushing this topic in 2022. So maybe just start with those two questions, if I may, Minister. Yeah, no, I mean, two, two I think, very fair questions. So, you know, I, I, I think people also who are, who are listening may ask the question, why do we choose to push this to a vote now? Um, and why do we not keep working to try to get consensus with, the, uh, with, uh, with Russia and China? I mean, the first thing I would say is that China didn't vote against here, they, they abstained. Uh, and I think that was, it. that was an achievement in itself. Um, I mean, they chose not to, to support the Russian approach, uh, which, was to, which was to veto this, um, this resolution. Um, I mean, look, we felt that, um, that it, was, it, was, it was right to brace, basically bring this issue to a head. Um, given um, the makeup of the council next year, and the, the timing of the debate uh, in a post-COP environment, uh, we felt that it was probably uh, the most opportune time to actually put the question to the council in a resolution, um, even though we knew that there was a risk that, that it could be vetoed. Uh, but I think it was still worth doing. You know, we, we managed to galvanize 113 member states of the UN to be co-sponsors uh, for this resolution. I think that's a big statement in itself. It's very rare that that happens uh, in terms of that kind of number. And of course, we managed to get 12 of the 15 um, permanent, uh, sorry, 12 of the 15 members of the Security Council um, uh, to, uh, to vote in favor. Uh, and we only had one permanent um, um, member state that was willing to, to, to vote against. So I think this sends out a very clear signal uh, that the UN more generally uh, recognizes that there is absolutely a risk between, or sorry, absolutely a connection between, um, between climate change uh, and the risks that it poses and the pressures that it puts on communities and conflict. Uh, and if you look at the, the areas where the EU has a peacekeeping, where the UN, I should say, has a peacekeeping presence around the world, you will see that in many of those countries, they are also really at the coalface in terms of trying to manage uh, the fallout from, um, from climate change. So if you take the Sahel, for example, um, around the Lake Chad region and so on, um, uh, the pressures on a changing, of a changing climate, the, uh, the competition for scarce resources, land, water, and so on, which is driving tensions, driving conflict, uh, you see a very practical um, you know, manifestation of uh, climate change contributing to tension and, and conflict. And really that's all we were trying to get established. Um, Russia has a different perspective. Uh, they believe that uh, the climate issues should be discussed elsewhere uh, and that the Security Council should be focusing on, uh, on other drivers of, of conflict. Um, we don't agree with them on that. The vast majority of uh, UN member states don't agree with them on that and the vast majority of Security Council member states don't agree with them either. Um, so, you know, I think, 
Um, I think this was worth doing, despite the fact that it, 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 it had a frustrating end. Um, I don't think there's likely to be a resolution put to a vote anytime soon in terms of the, the weeks and potentially months ahead. But certainly there are many other like-minded countries that will want to work with Ireland uh, to try and find a way of bringing forward a resolution at some point in the future. And even without a resolution, I think you're going to see climate uh, and climate related issues be part of Security Council debates uh, and press statements and discussion uh, in the months ahead. And certainly Ireland will be part of that discussion. So, you know, all is not lost here. Um, I think it would have been great to have a formal recognition of climate being part of the security discussion on the Security Council and a resolution that could reinforce that. Um, but even without that resolution, uh, I don't think anybody doubts that, um, that, that that climate is now very much part of the security discussion on the Council and will continue to be, uh, and certainly Ireland, but I know many others as well. I mean, you know, we, we're, we're going to have a Norwegian presidency in the first month of, of next year. I know they're also uh, very, very strong in this space. Um, so, you know, you haven't heard the last of this just because it's been vetoed by, um, by one country. Yes, uh, thank you, Minister. And in fact, the, the, there are more questions on this than any other than any other area. And I see one just came in since I asked the initial two from Siobhan uh, Kern of Trokera, um, um, uh, you know, just asking for what do you envisage as the next steps towards the UN Security Council resolution on climate and security, and are there developments uh, that you think Ireland can secure in 2022? I think you've addressed that. But actually, just as you, um, just in the interest of uh, sharing this uh, question with you from the Russian embassy, indeed, uh, Igor Alexev um, asks, uh, Excellency, what arguments presented by the Russian side on climate and security uh, draft resolution do you consider irrelevant, incorrect, or false? And which of them do you understand and share? I think you've addressed that to some extent, but maybe you'd like to um, yeah. develop yeah. a little bit more. And maybe also, Minister, obviously, you know, uh, India and, and uh, China obviously had views uh, that were clearly contrary to ours as well. It's not just uh, obviously Russia vetoed, uh, but India and China obviously didn't support either. Yeah, and look, I mean, what I would say about Russia is that they have been remarkably consistent on this issue. You know, they 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 said that if we bring this a resolution forward, they won't support it. Um, and you know, so you know, our relationship with the um, uh, the Russian team in New York is a good one. We speak to them all the time. Um, they were very clear that they would, wouldn't be supporting this uh, and would vote against it if it came forward. We hoped we could change their mind on that. Um, it didn't happen, but that doesn't mean that we don't continue to talk to Russia about this issue. They believe that, that um, my understanding uh, of, the, uh, of the Russian position is that they believe climate issues should be dealt with elsewhere in the UN system uh, and that the Security Council should remain focused on, if you like, more traditional drivers of conflict uh, as they may see it. Um, uh, they were willing to, um, to look at, uh, at a statement uh, that involved um, a geographical um, uh, statement around um, uh, climate change and pressures uh, in, in, in the Sahel region uh, and around the Lake Chad region. Um, um, that wasn't something that that, um, uh, that gained a lot of support because what people wanted was a more general resolution which, which accepted the principle of climate change as a driver and as an accelerator of conflict uh, and, uh, and you know, undermining security. So, you know, to be fair to Russia, their, their view on this hasn't changed. Uh, it, is, uh, it has been consistent um, uh, and they voted on that basis. That being said, it is disappointing um, that any country would choose to use a veto, uh, any one of the P5 would choose to, uh, to use a veto on a thematic resolution like this, which is doesn't happen that often, um, particularly given uh, the focus on climate this autumn with COP26, with the level of ambition that people are, are setting now, the idea that we effectively continue to formally ignore the relationship between climate change and security um, is regrettable from my perspective, but I, I don't want to pretend that Russia surprised us. To be fair to them, they didn't. They signaled that they would vote against and they did. Uh, I still think uh, it was worth pursuing though, um, and we'll continue to, to talk to Russia in that regard. Ch um, you know, India's 
India's perspective on this uh, is somewhat different um, uh, in terms of their own uh, views on on climate and you know economic development and so on in India. Uh, they also um, had a view that impacted on the final um, wording that was agreed in, in in COP26. If you can remember, there was a very strong you know Indian uh, push in relation to to coal at the very end. Um, so. Again, that wasn't a big surprise, but you know, we we also have a good relationship with India uh, on the Security Council, and we'll continue to uh, to talk to them. Their their position on this wasn't as strategically important as Russia's, of course, because they're not a P5 member. Therefore, um, they can vote against something without vetoing it. Um, um, so so you know, our our focus uh, with both China and Russia was. Um, was intense uh, in the build-up to this vote, and I think it's it's a testament actually to our team in New York that that China decided to abstain rather than vote against. But unfortunately, that result wasn't um, wasn't uh, achievable with Russia this time. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, just to say to um, the audience, we have at least 25 questions in at the moment. We're not going to get to them all, so some of them will be grouped, obviously, uh, to the best of our ability. But I do want to come uh, to the other, um, another dominant theme in those questions, and that's the issue of Syria, uh, um, which, of course, you alluded to in your speech, you addressed in your speech. And a question from uh, Gufran uh, Kulani, and uh, please accept my apologies if I didn't uh, pronounce that correctly, but who is a Syrian refugee who says, following my presentation to the Oireachtas uh, Joint Foreign Affairs Committee at the end of April, committee members, including uh, Deputy uh, Charlie Flanagan, chair of the committee, highlighted the need for prioritization of uh, the issue of forcible, uh, forcibly disappeared uh, Syrians. But there has not been any progress on this issue at all. While daily Syrians are disappeared with impunity, might Minister Coveney please comment on this issue? And a second question on this issue, if I may, Minister, from uh, Leonie uh, O'Dowd, um, who asks uh, the immense effort by the Irish team to ensure the continuation of the aid crossing into northwest Syria is appreciated, including within Syria. However, the threat uh, by Russia to veto the continuation of this crossing continues, as well as their insistence on closing all other crossings. What is Minister Coveney's view? on the need for council reform and a potential mechanism to bypass the veto in future. And I think there's one other question as well, Minister, while, I, while I'm at it on Syria. And uh, indeed it's from um, um, uh, Ronan Tynan, uh, who's a member of the Institute here, who asks, as Russia and China have vetoed the referral of Syria in the UN Security Council to the ICC, would he consider proposing a resolution in the General Assembly to refer the country to the ICC? Um, yeah, so a number, a number of questions there. Um, first of all, uh, just on the ICC, I mean, Ireland are big supporters of the ICC um, and continue to speak up to, to protect that structure. Um, uh, we believe it's important to do so because um, you know, even countries that we're close to uh, are um, some of whom are are not supportive of the ICC uh, are not doing that. Um, and I think um, certainly we would be very supportive of an ICC role in terms of uh, ensuring accountability uh, for for many of the atrocities and war crimes across Syria. Uh, that's for sure. And certainly, I'm open to to looking at any ways in which we could progress that. Um, um, comments in relation to the use of the veto. I mean, I think it's important for us to be both honest and realistic here. Um, I wish the veto didn't exist. Um, uh, and I wish that the Security Council could make decisions um, um, without the frustration of the veto being used at times um, and at times inappropriately. Um, but the veto does exist. Uh, and I don't see that any changing anytime soon. Um, I know France led efforts uh, a number of years ago to try to get agreement on limiting the use of the veto, um, particularly in cases when um, there are breaches of international humanitarian law or um, atrocities uh, being committed. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I would really like to see that uh, discussion re-emerging again next year. But I think the idea that, that P5 countries are going to 
voluntarily give up the use of the veto. I just don't think that's realistic. Um, uh, and instead, uh, I think we should uh, be trying to, to look at more modest reform of the Security Council that may actually be achievable um, rather than um, sort of the perfect solution, um, which uh, certainly for now isn't achievable. I mean, I also think, by the way, that the um, Security Council doesn't reflect um, uh, the, or doesn't reflect accurately, at least, um, uh, global politics right now. You know, there are, there are enormous countries that aren't, that don't have a permanent seat on the Security Council. There are continents that aren't um, represented in the way that they should be. Um, and, you know, I think Ireland has been very upfront about that reform agenda and where we stand on it. Uh, but again, I think we are both pragmatic and realistic in terms of both the pace of change and the, the level of ambition of that change in the short term. Um, in relation to the Bab al Hawa crossing, yeah, so, um, you know, I, I visited that crossing at the start of the year, um, uh, which was hugely helpful, actually, to get our, certainly to get my head around why this crossing is so important. Um, it, it effectively is a, a vehicle to support about three and a half million people uh, who rely on aid and support uh, that comes through the only international crossing into Syria. Uh, which is into the Idlib um, province of Syria. Um, um, you know, different countries have different perspectives in relation to, to this crossing. Uh, and I know that um, the Russian and the Iranian and the Syrian view uh, is that there are dangers with facilitating this crossing because in some ways it's, it's supporting a continuing opposition to the Assad regime. Um, um, we see it as a humanitarian necessity. Um, and that's why um, I'm glad to say we managed to win the argument um, with the help of, of Norway and many others uh, to keep it open for at least another 12 months. Um, that agreement was essentially six months and six months. So in the next few weeks, we will need to get agreement in the Security Council to extend for the full 12 months after a, an assessment of the first six months. Um, I am, I'm hopeful and confident that we'll be able to do that. Um, but you know, we have had very direct discussions with, with Russia in relation to their, their concerns here, and those discussions will, uh, will, will continue. Um, um, but I certainly hope that, that we'll be able to continue to, uh, to facilitate uh, a hugely significant um, border crossing for, uh, for many, many families. Um, by the way, I think it's, it's also important to say that we are insisting on as much transparency as is possible in terms of what is actually shipped across that border. Uh, and I do believe that having the UN at the centre of responsibility in terms of the Bab al-Hawa crossing gives as much uh, transparency as, as is possible uh, on a crossing like this, where you have hundreds of trucks a day um, crossing the border. Uh, and so even from a from a Russian perspective, um, um, you know, I think there is a lot of sense in this being a UN managed operation where UN transparency and credibility is is part of what's happening there. Um, but as I say, Ireland's approach on this, and I think most countries uh, would agree with this, is that this is a humanitarian necessity uh, that needs to be kept in place. Uh, by the way, uh, in in June, we got unanimous agreement for an extension for six months and six months, uh, including the support of Russia, uh, which I think is important um, to recognize, um, given the fact that they had uh, grave reservations in relation to it uh, in advance of that. Um, in terms of forced disappearance uh, in Syria, yeah, I mean, this is just a horror. You know, I mean, the, the number of people who have um, disappeared without any form of trial or, uh, or legal process. Uh, I, in Syria is, uh, is, a, is a source of enormous concern. Um, you know, Ireland, of course, will want to play its part in highlighting that. The real question is, though, how do we change it? You know, and, um, uh, and how does the, um, uh, the UN system actually deal with a, an ongoing conflict uh, 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 in Syria, a regime that most countries don't want to recognize, uh, understandably so, uh, and how do we um, how do we progress in a way 
that, uh, um, that reduces the extraordinary misery uh, uh, that continues to be inflicted on, on Syrian people. Um, and that is something that Ireland will, I hope, be in the center of uh, you know, over the next 12 months in terms of uh, debates at the Security Council on Syria. And I know different countries have very different perspectives on this and how we got to where we are today. Um, but I hope Ireland can be somewhat of a bridge um, while uh, remaining very much consistent with an EU position um, in relation to how we should um, approach the ongoing Syrian conflict. Um, but um, but if, you're, if your caller wants to, to send me any details of, of individuals who have disappeared or, are, or have been imprisoned, uh, we can certainly try to follow up Farham uh, on, on those cases. Thank you, Minister. I'm sure that's very much appreciated. And uh, just a change maybe um, to, to um, uh, Ethiopia. And I think you said in your speech that when we were elected to the council last year, we didn't expect Ethiopia to be the center of our work. There's a question in here from Sulanya uh, Maitra. And again, forgive me if I got the pronunciation wrong, but she's a lecturer uh, in UCD. And the question is, in the context of the Ethiopian conflict, has Ireland's role on behalf of the UN Security Council eroded some of the diplomatic capital Ireland had with the Ethiopian government, which might have helped in gaining humanitarian access to people in need? Maybe. Um, um, but I think, um, you know, I think our role on Security Council has probably been to be arguably the most proactive country in relation to shining a spotlight on what has been happening for a year now in Ethiopia. Um, we know, and it's been backed up by, by independent um, uh, reports since, you know, we know that there have been very significant atrocities, uh, in, including uh, the, um, the use of, of sexual violence as a tool of intimidation and conflict um, uh, in, in Tigray, but not only in the Tigray region, in other parts of Ethiopia as well. Um, and, you know, our, you know, our fear here uh, is that Ethiopia uh, that has, and it's a country of 115, 120 million people. It's Africa's second largest um, country in population terms. Um, and it, it has been a source of stability in the Horn of Africa uh, for the last uh, number of decades. And it, of course, has been a fantastic partner for Ireland. I mean, we've spent more in Africa and invested more in the part, sorry, in Ethiopia and invested more in a partnership with Ethiopia than any other African country. Uh, in recent in recent years, um, but having said that, we 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 felt we had to simply call out the truth of what was happening, uh, particularly in the context of uh, you know blockades that have been uh, imposed to prevent humanitarian aid and assistance getting to people who desperately need it, um, um, the the um, and atrocities that have been committed by by soldiers and by paramilitary groups. Um, uh, and of course, um, uh, with a view to not taking sides, but simply calling out the truth uh, of what was happening. And, and we continue to do that today. Um, and as a result of that approach, um, the, um, the Ethiopian government has uh, taken exception to that um, uh, in terms of some of the things that we've been saying. Uh, and of our six um, Irish diplomats uh, in the embassy in Addis Ababa, four of them have been asked to leave. Um, I, I, I think that is absolutely regrettable, but there, there have been UN diplomats that have been asked to leave as well. You know, the, Ireland isn't, isn't alone in being targeted. Um, um, but look, we continue to, to reach out to all sides in the Ethiopian conflict. Uh, we've invested a lot of time in that, uh, in that outreach. I met the Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister in New York a few months ago. We, we actually had a very long and I think a very useful meeting. Uh, we didn't agree on everything, but we certainly, I think, uh, had an understanding of each other's perspectives. And we continue now to, um, to, within the UN Security Council system, to try to do everything we can to bring about a ceasefire, um, uh, to bring about um, uh, a removal of the blockade that prevents uh, international humanitarian assistance getting to literally millions of people now that need it and of course to promote an inclusive political dialogue uh, between the warring parties um, so that we can focus on protecting 
um, Ethiopia's uh, sovereign integrity as a country. Um, uh, and uh, we can look ahead to, um, to a political process that can resolve outstanding issues as opposed to uh, military interventions. We don't believe that there is a military solution to the, um, uh, to the deep uh, animosity and differences uh, between um, uh, warring parties at the moment in Ethiopia. Uh, and so we want to work with all sides, including the Ethiopian government, uh, to, uh, to try and bring about a, a peaceful resolution um, but at the moment, um, the prospects of that look uh, look quite remote, uh, and um, this conflict may get, unfortunately, uh, worse before it gets better. Uh, thank you, Minister. I'm just going to take uh, one question, maybe two questions here on, on Myanmar. Um, one from Niall O'Keefe from Trokara. Um, uh, he wonders, while not the penholder on Myanmar, what can Ireland and the UN Security Council do to avert the rapidly deteriorating humanitarian crisis in Myanmar uh, following uh, the, the coup. And I think there's a second question here, if I can find it. Um, uh, just one moment now. Um, uh, on Myanmar, yes, it's from Quiva de Barra, who's the CEO of Trokara. It's, um, uh, she says, will Ireland press for a resolution on Myanmar next year, including condemning both attacks on civil society and the very high levels of gender-based violence perpetrated by the Myanmar security forces? So just those two questions on Myanmar, Minister. Yeah, um, well, first of all, we're, we're very concerned uh, at what's happening in, in Myanmar. Um, so I'm giving a note here. Um, I mean, let me just give you the official position, and then I'll give you a, I'll give you a, a sort of a personal view on it. Um, uh, the crisis remains on the agenda of the Security Council, and, and will continue, and will con continue to to follow developments closely, as you'd expect. The Council has spoken as one in condemning the violence against peaceful protesters, including against women, uh, young people, and children. Uh, we've expressed deep concern at restrictions on medical personnel, civil society. Labour union members, um, journalists, and media workers, uh, and called for the immediate release of all those detained um, arbitrarily. Um, this unity sends a clear message, I think, to the military. However, I would like to see the Security Council move beyond sim a simple expression of concern and hoping for change. And I'd like to see the Security Council agree more tangible actions to ensure peace and democracy in, in Myanmar. Ireland has used our position on the Security Council to highlight the targeting of women uh, by the Myanmar military and to promote the inclusion and meaningful participation of women in dialogue and negotiations for peace. Ireland was pleased to be a member of the core group of nations who proposed the uh, June 2021 uh, uh, UN uh, General Assembly resolution that called for a stop to the flow of arms to Myanmar. Uh, we've also been working with the uh, EU uh, at the third committee of the UN General Assembly uh, uh, session, uh, that's the 76th session, uh, to address the um, uh, persistence of human rights violations and abuses uh, and consider the progress towards restoring civilian government. Uh, we look forward to working with the new UN Special Envoy uh, as she commences uh, her role this week. So um, I've had some, some very interesting discussions with the Chinese foreign minister on this issue. Uh, I think it would be accepted that China probably has more influence on Myanmar than any other country. Um, we've also um, uh, spoken to many other partners on the Security Council in terms of what could actually uh, trigger a real change in approach from the military leaders in Myanmar, as opposed to simply making statements that um, uh, that, that are useful in themselves, but don't actually bring about real change on the ground. Um, so really this is about trying to be persuasive and building pressure on a military leadership that need at some point in the future to facilitate a return to civilian-led government in their country. Uh, and of course, a release of political prisoners who should be very much part of that process. Um, but um, we'll, we'll very much be part of those discussions uh, and if Niall or, or Quiva want to, to make contact with me in relation to that, if they have um, thinking that, that they think would be helpful, we'd be, be more than happy to, to have that conversation with them. I've, um, uh, I've taken quite an interest in 
in Burma, Myanmar, um, uh, in the past when I was in the uh, uh, the um, uh, the European Parliament uh, and uh, and since uh, and this is this is a this is an issue that I I think our Irish people would like us to be involved in um, in advocating for solutions on in the Security Council. So that's very much the space we're in, but not easy. Uh, and actually, the more advice you take from people who who know uh, the military leadership. Um, uh, the more complex actually this challenge becomes because I think standard pressure won't work. Um, uh, we need to look at other ways of, um, uh, of facilitating that change. And I think, I think China uh, are, are a really important part of, uh, of that pressure. Thank you, Minister. We're just coming towards uh, the end now, and I'm just going to maybe um, um, uh, re reference uh, a number of questions here, uh, not necessarily uh, in any way related, but just with a view to maybe giving you the opportunity to touch on them, because I think that's all maybe we'll have time for. A question here from Anya Kenny of the Irish Times. Um, I think you've addressed the first part of our question, which is, do you think the veto system needs to be changed? needs to change in light of recent events. Uh, do you think it will, can be changed? The second question from ours, how has having a seat on the UN Security Council benefited Ireland? And her third question was, how has Ireland's seat benefited other uh, countries? Um, a separate question here uh, from, um, uh, from um, Paul Gillespie, in, again, a member of the Institute, of course, formerly the, the Irish Times wants to know how effectively does the minister think Irish media, the Irish media have covered the first year um, of Ireland's membership of the Security Council. And, and then a question here, just to wrap up maybe, and I appreciate you can only touch on these, they're very diverse. Question here from Michael Becker of the School of Law and Trinity College. And, and he asked a question, I suppose, about the, in around the efficacy of sanctions, to what extent, uh, you know, the UN Security Council uh, sanctions, um, uh, uh, how, how they might be made a more effective and meaningful tool, and is Ireland engaged in any initiative on this issue? And one further question from Michael Becker, again, is, and I just don't want to leave it unspoken, I suppose, because it is of concern to many people, and that's in relation to Yemen and what, if anything, can be done to alleviate um, the situation there. So uh, with, with those, uh, which replies to these questions, Minister, we'll wrap it up, okay? You're on mute. Sorry, you'd, you'd, think, I'd, you'd think I'd know that at this stage. Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, just on, on Yemen, because, um, you know, and I, I would have spoken uh, to Martin Griffiths uh, many times on, on Yemen when, when he was the UN um, special representative on that file. And I've spoken to his successor. Um, we met, um, we met in, uh, in Amman, in Jordan, um, a few weeks ago. Um, but we do have to make sure that Yemen stays on the agenda um, because there's so many other conflicts ongoing that sometimes Yemen can be sort of the forgotten conflict and the the scale of the misery uh, in Yemen um, uh, is enormous, um, and the the ongoing consequences of uh, of of conflict there, from a humanitarian point of view, are, are just off the scale. Um, so, um, in truth, uh, I wouldn't be predicting um, any major breakthrough in terms of peace breaking out and a ceasefire. Uh, anytime soon, uh, as in in the coming uh, weeks. Um, but I, um, I certainly think that um, that in the medium term uh, there can be a basis for agreement. But um, but I, again, like so many conflicts, um, the conflict in Yemen will be determined by by actors not in Yemen at all, um, whether that's in in Saudi Arabia or whether it's in Iran uh, or indeed um, other sponsors of, of conflict uh, and their influence on, on Houthis and, uh, and others in the, the Yemeni's conflict. Um, and the Security Council has to apply pressure there, uh, and I think it will. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the veto system, yeah, look, I mean, for, for a non-permanent member state of the Security Council, um, 
you know, the use of the veto is is extraordinarily frustrating. Um, um, but I think, as I said at the start, you know, it's important to be realistic here rather than idealist. Um, the the use of the veto is not going to change anytime soon. Uh, and I think our focus should be on trying to talk to permanent members of the Security Council about how we could limit the use of the veto in certain circumstances, um, which I think would be a huge step forward if, if we could even do that. Um, um, but I, I think it's a power that, that the P5 member states hold on to very closely, which is why it was interesting that France was actually leading the efforts to try to limit the use of the veto in certain circumstances. And I think that thinking should be very much supported by non-permanent member states of the Security wow. Council. Um, how has the Security Council benefited in Ireland? I mean, to be honest with you, I've never really looked at it through that prism. Um, I mean, I think it probably has benefited Ireland in terms of our profile internationally. Um, every 20 years or so, we've had the privilege of being on the Security Council. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it reinforces uh, the point that small countries matter in a multilateral system. Uh, and one of the reasons why Ireland uh, was successful in terms of getting enough votes to be on the Security Council, and we got, what was it, 128 votes uh, to get on the Security Council, um, it's because a lot of other small countries trust Ireland uh, to be a country that they can talk to uh, and a country that will listen to them and reflect their concerns uh, in a way that is um, not necessarily influenced by, by larger countries, which is why, you know, and we've seen it with Ethiopia, you know, Ireland will, will call out breaches of international law when we, when we believe it's the right thing to do. And sometimes that means that, uh, that countries we have close relationships with are unhappy with what we're saying. But I think that is the kind of approach that, that means that Ireland um, uh, uh, is on the Security Council because of the support of lots of other small countries that want that kind of um, voice uh, representing them on the Security Council. So I think, I, I think it is a benefit for Ireland uh, in terms of, uh, of our voice internationally. And, and don't forget for the last number of years, you know, our foreign policy has very much been about increasing Ireland's impact internationally. Um, we've opened lots of new embassies, lots of new consulates. Uh, we've invested heavily in, um, in expertise, more staff. Uh, I mean, Irish, uh, the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs has been in expansion mode and, and continues to be, and the Security Council is very much part of that in terms of magnifying our voice. Uh, and is it beneficial for other countries? I certainly hope so. Uh, and I certainly hope we can be a voice for, for many countries that feel that, um, that they don't have one internationally, uh, particularly in the context of, of conflict situations. Um, the media coverage of our role on the Security Council, I mean, I think it's been reasonably positive. Um, you know, given the magnitude of, of the other issues that are impacting on Irish people uh, and their families and their businesses uh, and their livelihoods, uh, particularly uh, linked to COVID and to a lesser extent, maybe Brexit and other issues. Um, you know, I think that when something of significant happens, of significance ha happens on the Security Council and Ireland is involved in that, it does get a bit of coverage. Um, I'd like to see a bit more of that if we could, but, but to be fair, when we got the resolution agreed on the Babel Hawa crossing, there was good coverage across, um, um, across the Irish media. Um, and I think when we fell short this week uh, because Russia decided to, to veto uh, the Irish and Niger-led resolution on, on climate and security. Again, I think there was, there was public commentary and some media coverage around that. So hopefully uh, we can generate interesting interventions uh, that matter to people uh, and that, that will get coverage um, yeah, as we move into next year. Um, and then just on the efficacy uh, of, of uh, of sanctions. Uh, I mean, our focus is very much on ensuring that both the UN and EU sanctions are targeted on specific individuals and entities and not on societies uh, or uh, general populations or economies as a whole. Uh, I think that's the appropriate uh, approach uh, to have proper workable humanitarian exemptions. Um, and that's been a big focus uh, of this year uh, at the Council, and I think will continue to be next year. So 
I mean, a good example of that is obviously on Afghanistan. You know, we, while nobody wants to recognize the Taliban as the legitimate government of Afghanistan, while there will continue to be sanctions against individuals, uh, uh, individual leaders of the Taliban, uh, we very much need to get and want to get uh, supports to people who need it in Afghanistan. We need a banking system to work to do that. Um, and of course, we need to make exemptions to, uh, to sanctions uh, regimes uh, that, that allow us to get support and aid uh, to people who desperately need it, whether that's paying the salaries of teachers and doctors and nurses, um, uh, or, or indeed just access uh, for physical um, um, uh, humanitarian assistance. Uh, into parts of Afghanistan. And that goes for, for many other countries as well, including Syria, by the way, um, uh, where there is a desperate need uh, for uh, humanitarian assistance. I think about 13 million Syrians rely on the international community for, uh, for um, humanitarian support and assistance. So um, sanctions are a, are a very difficult thing to get right. Um, but I think they are, there is a role for sanctions. You know, the international community has got to be able to respond in a real way uh, to create a consequence for breaches of international law. Um, but you know, we need to make sure that, that we are not taking decisions that mean that ordinary people suffer because their leaders are, are irresponsible. Um, and uh, there's so many examples of trying to get that balance right, whether it's Belarus, whether it's Yemen, uh, whether it's Syria, uh, whether it's um, Ethiopia, um, uh, Somalia, um, so many. Uh, and um, certainly our perspective is, as, is I, as I outlined earlier, let's hold individuals responsible for the decisions they make, but not necessarily the, um, uh, the, uh, the populations that they, that they rule. Um, so look, I think that's Answer. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just say thanks to everybody, by the way, and wish you all a happy Christmas. Uh, we've been through an extraordinary year in Ireland, and I suspect next year will be hopefully not as extraordinary, but certainly will be challenging as well. Um, but um, it, we're halfway through our term on the Security Council. And actually, we had a meeting this morning on setting uh, uh, targets and ambitions for action for next year in terms of how we use this extraordinary privileged position on the Security Council to be as impactful as we can be. So hopefully we'll have a, an opportunity to meet again in a few months time to, uh, uh, to assess how we're getting on. Look forward to that very much, Minister, and thank you very much for your generous um, uh, responses that we've trespassed on your time uh, in ways that we normally don't do, um, uh, but we've gone beyond the hour. Really, really appreciate it. Lots of questions that we haven't been able to get to, uh, but I think you've covered more than uh, more than uh, the sufficient amount in, in the time available, and there's always next year, and we look forward to being able to welcome you back uh, to the IAEA next year, maybe in person, but if not in person, then on Zoom. And we can pick up some of the issues that are current then, but maybe also some of the issues which um, obviously we haven't been able to address uh, fully today, uh, given the kind of the constraints on time. But wish you and your team, um, and uh, particularly your team in New York, um, led by Geraldine, Geraldine Bernason, Ambassador Bernason, obviously the very best, and um, just salute the work of Ireland in the multilateral field. And um, obviously, uh, we very much appreciate the comprehensive uh, briefing that you've given today.